This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. This Week in Microbiology, episode number 10, recorded on June 24th, 2011. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello. And this is TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today, right across the desk here in my office, my old colleague from TWIV and TWIP, Dixon de Palmier. Hello, Vince. Sorry I called you old. That's okay. I'm older than you. <laughs> <laughs> I meant it in a relative sense that I've known you I a long time. I have more annual rings than you do. <laughs> Dixon it does this week in virology and this week in parasitism, and I asked him to join us on today's episode of TWIM. Also joining us today from the Medical University of South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Good afternoon, Vincent, and everyone else. It's great to be back. Good to have you, as always, that bright voice of yours. Also joining us from the other side of the U.S., from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Hi there. How are you? How are you doing, Elio? I'm okay. I just came back from the East Coast. I was in Florida and in the D.C. area, and that was fine, but I'm glad I'm back here. You travel quite a bit, don't you? Yeah, unfortunately. But we missed you in uh, New Orleans. I know. I'm sorry I wasn't there. Yeah, maybe next year. We'll try. It'll be in San Francisco, won't it? I believe yeah. so. Yeah, that's easy enough for me. <laughs> and that other voice we're hearing is that of Margaret McFull Nye from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Welcome, Margaret. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Well, and Margaret. Margaret, I met in New Orleans for the first yeah. time. Yes, that Good was great. You. And in yeah, fact, that whole meet meeting you. that whole meeting was uh, a lot of your work, right? Uh, well, you know, so uh, Jeff Miller had put together, a UCLA professor who had been the chair of the meeting just before myself while I was vice chair, uh, he put... He uh, led a task force uh, that uh, the president, the person, Alison O'Brien, had been president. And during her term, she asked for a task force to be put together to uh, examine the general meeting. And so Jeff Miller led that task force. And Bonnie Bassler was on it. And she was the would-be president. And she decided she wanted to have it the new meeting format happen in her year, which was the <laughs> next year. And I was, it was my go going to be my first year as chair. So it was tense. I tell you, it was a lot of, <laughs> it was really a lot of work and, and, uh, it was, we were sort of flying by the seat of our pants, but I think, uh, by and large with a few small mistakes along the way, I think, uh, it was okay. You did a great job. Uh yeah. I heard nothing but good things about it, Margaret. Oh, good, Elio. You know, it it there were there are a couple of things that we really need to do, and one is to get a very much bigger uh, representation of the young uh, microbiologists, because you know, this the field of microbiology is exploding, and and they're going to be the future. So I'm really excited about you know bringing them back into the speaking group, and also. Uh, we started a group called the Junior Advisors of the ASM meeting, and that's a group led of 10 postdocs and assistant professors led by wow. Rob Knight. Yeah, so that's, that's wow. going to be good. So you're, you're doing this for the next meeting as well, correct? Yes, that's right. So this, this uh, I'll be doing uh, the chair position uh, is a three-year position. So you're vice chair for three years, chair for three years, and past chair for three years. Wow. So it's a long it's kind nine of nine years. Commitment. Yeah, it is. Wow. <laughs> it's a long commitment. Good for you. Except Jeff got out of his three year past chair by becoming president of ASM. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> that was a. So he's a very a, clever UCLA professor. <laughs> he is. He is. He's, he's amazing. Yep. Great. Yep, yep. Well, it was a great meeting. I'm looking forward to the next one. Yeah, yeah, I hope it fun. will be. I hope we keep uh, improving the quality. I'm sure it'll be fun. Yeah. Well, today we're talking about your work, Margaret. I thought this would wow. be a good time because when you were on TWIM at the very beginning, mm -hmm. you, you had mentioned this wonderful squid system, and I thought mm -hmm. it was so cool. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so we get, you, you gave us two papers. One of them we'll start with is um, called Microbial Factor Mediated Development in a Host Bacterial Mutualism. And I thought we could start by first having you describe to us this wonderful system of the bobtail 
squid that you study? So, um, so one of the things that's become very clear is that all animals are likely to uh, form lifelong relationships with microorganisms. And of course, as we all know, this in humans is becoming really a big deal. The problem is with humans, we don't, we have 2,300 or so different kinds of bacteria. And so to try to figure out what the conversation is, you know, sort of the molecular dialogue between the host human and all of its microbes is like being in a really loud cocktail party, you know, <laughs> where you're trying to understand what's going on. And so um, just as developmental biology looks for simple models, it's very simple systems in which you can try to understand how development of animals works, in symbiosis, that is animal bacterial and animal fungal and animal viral interactions that are benign, what we're, what we're doing is we're also looking for very, very simple models. So the squid is such a simple model. And so what it is, the reason why I say it's simple is because there's one bacterial species or one bacterial phylotype or species and one host animal. So we know that there's not more than one for sure. That's right. That's right. At least, uh, you know, there's a little twist and that's the females have another, um, another symbiosis that has a consortium of bacteria. Mm -hmm. But in the light organ, there's just one bacterial species called Vibrio fisheri, and it's a luminous bacterium. And the other thing that's really good about this symbiosis is that most symbioses, the, what the bacteria give to the animal or to humans is help with digestion or they give them a vitamin or some nutrient. In this case, what the, what the bacteria give the animal is light. And so in the, in, in the light is used by the animal as a camouflaging mechanism. In other words, it shines light in so that it, it actually is, comes out at night and feeds in the water column in, in the Hawaiian waters. It's a Hawaiian animal, so it comes out of the sand. It lives in the sand during the day. It comes out of the sand and hangs up in mid, mid-water, just hangs up there, you know, several feet above the seafloor. And it emits light out of its ventral surface that the bacteria have made for it and it matches downwelling moonlight and starlight. So it's like a Klingon cloaking device. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it doesn't. So basically, it doesn't cast a shadow against the visual field of a predator looking up from below. So it's anti predatory. Margaret, but that, they, is that, how do we know this? Is it, has anyone ever taken the light away and watched them get eaten? <laughs> well, so they haven't done that with Euprimna. Uh huh. But people have done uh, that sort of thing in other animals that counter But they, this is a behavior called counter-illumination. It's like counter-shading, except it's counter-illumination. So, so that has been done with other animals. In Euprimna, we, this, uh, this squid is called Euprimna scolopes. And in Euprimna, the, all, all the morphology suggests that. And in the laboratory... If you give them light from above of a certain level, they'll give you a certain level. If you increase the level, mm. they'll give you more. If you decrease it, you'll give you this. So there's the wow. physiological potential to do that. What Whether happens not, when it's cloudy, for instance, or there's no moon? Yeah. So they have two ways to modulate <laughs> their the amount of light. And one is that the bacteria, you know how squid have ink? You know, they, mm. they, they squirt out ink. Well, the light organ is embedded in the ink sac. And so, <laughs> and, yeah, and so the ink sac oh, have amazing. diverticula on them that move over the culture and make it wow. brighter or darker. Amazing. And the other thing is that luminescence, all luminescence reactions require oxygen. And the animal can withhold oxygen, with can and does, under certain circumstances, withhold oxygen. Amazing. Does that depend on the amount of light that it thinks it's getting from above? I yes. Mean, it really modulates that. Yes. And so it, wow. it seems to perceive the amount of light in two ways. One is through the eye. And then we have evidence that the light organ tissues around the luminous bacteria 
actually can see the light made by the bacteria. I'd like to talk about that a little bit later and I'll bring yeah. up another point. Uh, well, you wanna, <laughs> I know what the point is now. Uh, I've been absolutely stunned that a light organ exists not only in animals like your squid, mm -hmm. but exists in unicellular proteins like dinoflagellates. Oh, uh, yeah. The organ is called the ocelloid, mm -hmm. and it is so fantastic to see something that looks like an eye in a single-celled organism. <laughs> it has a lens, a cornea, and what looks like a retina. Wow. Yeah. There's a good yeah. article, by the way, in this month's uh, Scientific American on the evolution of the eye. Right. Oh, cool. And it, I don't know, I'm not sure it goes back that far, but it's a wonderful article in many ways. The idea is that this, uh, the development of this organ in the single cell dinoflagellates is not the same as the development of the eye, that this is a case of convergent evolution. But mm -hmm. who knows, you know, this is up, up for grabs. See, in our but, case, in, in the case of the light organ that's in the squid, it also has lenses and a, and a choroid analog and, mm -hmm. you know, and the thing that's very cool is that it actually does look like the development might be convergent. And not, I mean, might be controlled in the same way that the eye development ah. is controlled. So it mm -hmm. might be different from the dinoflagellate. Sure. Well, it likely is. Yeah. So, Mark, did you, who, who began studying this particular squid? So, you know what? So, um, people had studied this animal to study um, uh, cephalopod embryology. Mm -hmm. And so, when I was a graduate student, um, I was studying, actually, I was at UCLA, and my study site was the Central Philippines, and I was studying um, luminous bacteria in fishes. And it made me crazy because I couldn't raise the animals and look at the onset of the association. So I was at a meeting and somebody said to me, did you know that there's this cool squid in Hawaii that the cephalopod biologists have been, have been growing uh, and studying for, to study cephalopod development and embryology? Which what that meant was that you could bring them into the lab and that they would lay eggs and and you could watch development. And I knew um, that this animal also had a symbiosis, and it was very likely with a very well understood marine bacterium, Vibrio fisheri. So I got very excited. And I approached a bunch of microbiologists, and they didn't want to work on it. <laughs> and finally, I approached Ned. <laughs> yeah, well, I approached Ned Ruby, and I said, Would you be interested? And he had worked, he was Ken Nielsen's first student. Oh. Ken, Ken was a really famous uh, luminous bacterial physiologist at Scripps Oceanography, and Ned had gotten his PhD in working on Vibrio fisheri. By that time, he was studying something completely different, but he said he'd let one portion of the lab work on it, and that was 1989, and so that's how the whole thing mm. started, and now there are about 15 labs that work on this symbiosis. And one, I had one more question. What does the bacterium get out of this? So oh. uh, they get the. I, so that's a good question because I often tease the bacteriologists and, and say that the bacteria are enslaved. <laughs> but, 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 but in fact, uh, the, what the bacteriologists tell me is that any place where you can get that many nutrients and, yeah. and you know that's a good place. So in seawater, more importantly. Yeah. Yeah. And so the, you're, if you go into any ocean in the world, will you find these bacteria, Vibrio fishery? So Vibrio fisheri, fisheri. Uh, is found in most every, every body of water. Um, not, it's, it's typically temperate uh, to subtropical is where it's most abundant, but you will often find it outside of that. And in the deep sea organisms? Um, so Pete Greenberg and Ned Ruby, when they were postdocs with Woody Hastings at Harvard, uh, they did a study in which they went to the Puerto Rican trench and wow. they, they took a transect, you know, they went down and they sampled it at a whole variety of depths and they found fisheri quite deep, you know, thousands of meters. Wow. So, you know, who knows? Um, and those were viable cells. In other words, they do, this wasn't the, this was know, before the days of PCR. That's right. That's right. And so they were putting them on plates. So wow. yeah, so they can they can be quite a few places. Now the thing that's interesting is that you find that there are so many different strains, and there are some strains that won't colonize the squid. 
And there are some strains that will. I think there are specific receptors involved here. Right. And also they may exclude other bacteria as well, right? Yeah. Oh, they, yeah, in the absence of uh-huh. Vibrio fisheri and the surrounding seawater, nothing else colonizes the, the animal. Mm-hmm. That's really marvelous. What, what's the story there? Is it just receptors, do you think? Specific so, for fisheri? Well, so I think that it's a very complex minuet, or you might think of it as spy versus spy. So they, <laughs> so they, they say to, there seem to, I mean, the evidence we have is that there's this very long progression from being outside as part of the bacterial plankton to being gathered by the host animal outside of the tissues and then invading host tissues. And each one of those steps, there's a winnowing and a selection. Mm. And at the very end, you only get fisher eye. So it's like spy versus spy. You know, are you the right partner? Yes, I'm the right partner. Are you sure you're the right partner? <laughs> sort of thing. So, Well, Margaret, one of the fascinating things I think you said in the beginning is this uh, lifelong relationship that's developed. And so I guess the question that immediately came to my mind, especially as we begin to port this concept to the microbiome in in humans and the complex relationships that are going on there, is do antibiotics or if could antibiotics cause a divorce of this lifelong relationship where you'll never get back together Mm -hmm. or would antibiotics simply induce a separation uh, uh, between the fisher eye and your your poor bobtail squid. Yeah, if you treat them with antibiotics, uh, you know, to ones that to which Vibrio fisheri is sensitive, the entire light organ, is, the the whole symbiosis is lost, and, and so it never is never restored again because it has to happen after the juvenile squid emerges. Yeah, so so um, you know, for there is like a period of time over which you can colonize them again. It's like there's what they call that in humans is neonatal tolerance. You know, you you, uh-huh. you're kind of will take things in uh, when you're younger and then you're, you're more discriminating a little bit later. Well, um, right. that's true of the squid. In other words, if you cure them for the, for several days, they will take them in. But if you cure them later in life, you cannot get them to recolonize. Isn't it remarkable though, when you look at, all of the life forms in the ocean that employ uh, uh, bioluminescence, it's the same species of bacteria, but various strains. How different are the genomes, if you spread them out, of all of the Vibrio fisheri? Well, one, one really good example um, uh, was the, vib- the strain that occurs in the squid. You might call the squid-specific strain. There's also a fish symbiont that is Vibrio fisheri. If you ask the squid if it will make a symbiosis with the fish symbiont, it won't. Hmm. However, um, what Mark Mandel found is that there is a gene in the squid symbiont that is responsible for encoding uh, an exopolysaccharide. On the, <laughs> in other uh-huh. words, a surface, a surface goo right. on the outside right. of the bacterial cell and if you take that gene and you put it into the fish symbiont, the fish symbiont will now be capable of colonizing the squid. <laughs> so, yeah. So there's there's there are these things that have happened to, to render specificity. And you think the uh, the differences might have arisen through ocean viruses that are trading genomes back and forth? Oh, that's an interesting idea. I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. The it's infamous phage. Yes. Some kind of lateral gene transfer, for sure. Because Vibrio cholera arose that way when they acquired some Enterobacteriaceae genes for enterotoxin. And yeah. prior to that, they were totally benign, and now they're causing havoc all over the place. Right. Can I ask a different question, Margaret? What's the collision frequency, uh, or how important is the collision frequency between the bacteria and the, the juvenile squids? In other words, how many bacteria does it take in terms of some volume in which the squid is for it to be able to colonize? And leading to that is, do you think there's any chemotaxis involved? Absolutely. <laughs> so, so one of the things that happens is when the squid hatches, it has 
on on the tissue that's going to be colonized, it has a very bizarre set of structures that are dedicated to to promoting the colonization. And basically what happens is there's a set of cells that shed mucus oh <clears throat> and the bacteria um, that, that are in the seawater begin to associate with that mucus. And I mentioned winnowing. One of the very cool things is no gram-positive neg- bacteria associate with that mucus, hmm. only gram-negative. And then, so you can put fisheri in there with a, you know other gram-negative bacteria, but eventually Vibrio fisheri will be the competitive dominant in this mucus. Hmm. And so there's this winnowing that goes on, and Vibrio fisheri, it appears now, uh, we're learning, attaches to the cilia. Um, and and we believe that they attach to the cilia that are on the outside, that are part of this bizarre structure uh, that is juvenile specific and that promotes infection. And so they're sticking out there. And when they stick, they talk to the animal. Uh, you know, they transport uh, talk, but they transport materials. In fact, it turns out to be one of the same elements that induces morphogenesis in that one paper. It's mm-hmm. the peptidoglycan monomer. They transport that to the animal, and the animal responds back uh, with, we think, shedding more antimicrobial things. And that may be what's causing there to be a winnowing down to only Vibrio fisheri. And so at first it starts out as being a really complex party, and then eventually it turns out to be just one bacterium. Then what happens is they're outside. And as Elio said, you know, how do they know where to go, right? So they have to find three pores on the surface, and they go into those pores. um, And the way that they find those pores is by chemotaxis. And so they, uh, they, the animal is um, releasing something that they are attracted to, and they they just swim toward that chemical that is being released out of those pores. Do you think it's the nitrate, nitrite, r- anaerobic respiration that's the selective pressure for these things? Because that's a great signal for something to hone to. Well, what we think it is, or we, what we have evidence for, is that it's chytobios, oh. which is really interesting because <laughs> I don't know if, if you followed Gary Skolnick's work on um, chitin being a chemoattractant for Vibrio cholera. So, and chitin causing changes in vibrio cholera gene expression and so on and so forth. So, chitobios looks to be the thing that is produced by the animal um, and that that is the molecule that that is the chemoattractant. And squid don't have any chitin other than that? They they do. do. They do. They do. They make chitin, yeah. Okay, okay. But in terms of the respiration, then that fits because you're you're putting out a carbon source right. that they have the unique metabolic potential to give them the selective advantage to degrade. But as any first year student knows, that unless you have that electron acceptor uh, that can take the carbon flow, you mm. you even though you have an infinite amount of substrate, unless you have that electron acceptor that can take the initial oxidation hits, Mm -hmm. you won't be able to utilize it. And so together, I think we begin to see how the Vibrio really has the selective advantage because of both this substrate, the chytobios, as well as the ability to do this anaerobic respiration. Well, the thing, one of the things that's cool is that it seems that they're it, at the initial stages, they're chemo, they chemotax to chytobios, and there might be quite a few of them. They go down a series of ducts, and they go into a big chamber, but on the other side of that chamber is a little bottleneck, and it looks like only a single cell squeezes through <laughs> the bottleneck oh my God. into the deep crypts and grows out. Now, um, what it in, in the early um, time of the symbiosis, we know that they likely grow on amino acids and a few other things. As the as the animal matures, uh, that that second paper by Weiradal, 
Um, mm-hmm. We show this di- diel rhythm that's in the adults, and the extent to which that diel rhythm is also present in the juveniles is something we're studying now. But you you see this use of of animal membranes over the day, followed by the use of chitin. So they chemotaxed to chitin in the beginning, and then they use it as a substrate. Yeah. Outstanding. Can you explain that now the the, the science paper basically what tracheal cytotoxin is and how it is involved in this invasion in the beginning? Yeah, well, you know, so so one of the things is that, you know, we've studied pathogens forever. You know, pathogens have just been the focus of microbiology as far as the association of bacteria with animals and humans. And so we always assume that these things that are on the surfaces of bacteria are are bad and that are to- they're toxic. And so the surface of all gram negative bacteria, um, almost all gram negative bacteria is there's a surface molecule called lipopolysaccharide, which uh, has a component that has been called endotoxin. It's the component that causes endotoxic shock. And so that's on the very surface. And then underneath, there's the cell wall of the bacterium that is um, gives integrity to the shape. And it's made of monomers. And those monomers in some species of bacteria are shed. And in fact, uh, that monomer, when it's shed, one of the bacteria that does this, and in fact, the bacterium that in which it was discovered was Bordetella pertussis, which huh. is the microorganism that causes whooping cough. cough. Yeah. And this peptidoclycan monomer was called tracheal cytotoxin oh. because it was thought to be one of the things that caused the destruction of the airway epithelia in whooping cough, right? Well, it's so now you've got endotoxin and you've got tracheal cytotoxin. <laughs> and so these are two molecules that bacteria just generally have, and, and people have been calling them toxins since the beginning of time. Well, it turns out that the bacteria, once they get into the squid, they go down, and as I mentioned, they grow out in these deep crypt spaces. And once they're in there, they induce the loss of those weird structures on the surface that are associated with colonization. So what they do basically is they go in and they close the door behind them, <laughs> right? And yeah. so what they do is they cause the loss of that. And so you ask yourself, how are they doing that? Well, they do it through talking to the animal with these molecules, with the endotoxin, which what had, you know, the same darn molecule that had been called endotoxin, lipid A, of the the lipopolysaccharide molecule and the peptidoglycan monomer, which had been called tracheal cytotoxin. And so those two, instead of being a toxin in this case, actually behave as a developmental cue to the animal. Now, one of the things that I thought was so cool about this was I happened to be over in Paris at the Pasteur and uh, they had asked me to give the opening talk about this stuff. And um, so I sat down after telling them about these molecules as morphogens. And the next person that got up was a guy named Gerard A. Barrel from the Pasteur. And it's been a long-standing question of how it is it, it's known that gram-negative bacteria are required for gut development of humans and mice and other sorts of things. Well, and they've never known why. (laughs) And so Girardi Birrell said to himself, well, if a squid can do it, (laughs) certainly a human (laughs) mouse can do it. And in fact, it turned out that the morphogen in in mammals is tracheal cytotoxin. And so in that paper that we published, my graduate student decided that instead of calling, so it had been that these surface molecules that are so common to bacteria had been called PAMPs. It stood for pathogen-associated molecular patterns. Well, she had the idea that you should call them MAMPs. And so at the end of that 2004 paper, she posited that we should call them microbe-associated molecular patterns. And so that was the that was the... Hallelujah. 
Yeah. Uh, I guess, uh, I've been I've been worried about pamps ever since Charles Janeway invented them. He was a yeah. fine immunologist, but to him, all bugs were pathogens. That's right. Mm. That's what happens when you get immunologists. And anyhow, it's a good point. Uh, yeah. I like yeah, that. Uh, one of our textbooks, we made a big point of calling them MAMPs and not PAMPs. Yeah. So in the, really in the field, how is MAMPs caught on? Do you have any sense of that? I, I think it's catching on. Yeah. I've seen Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, usually there is in parentheses, uh, you know, one time called PAMPs. PAMPs. Right. Because you know, from the virus perspective, we still call them PAMPs. You know? and so MAMPs to me was was something new, but I think it's perfect because even virus, not all viruses are pathogens, as here, you here. know. Right. That's right. And I think it goes back to the whole issue of now that we have the tools to study the microbiome and the complex interactions between the hosts, I think now is the time where we're going to become more inclusive of how these microbes that are often overwhelm the host genome by a factor of at least 10, if not larger in some instances, it really begins to illustrate how we may be, our genome may be the tail that's wag wagging the dog. Here, here. Oh, absolutely. Here, absolutely. Here. And, sure. you know, it, it, it's amazing because in the uh, Ruslan Medzitov, an immunologist, did a study in which he showed, he thought that if you could stop the signaling to the immune system of the microbiota of the gut, that that a mouse or a or a mammal would be healthier, and it turned out hmm. that we absolutely require the interaction with mamps for gut homeostasis. In yeah. other words, it, they turned out to be far worse off this if they true. couldn't signal with their microbiota. So that was another immunologist. I mean, he, you know, they uh, uh, they yeah. have a particular way of thinking, and and it's, <laughs> the, you know, they're what's really fun about this whole thing, in my opinion, is the field that is going to be most impacted is going to be immunology. Here, here. Uh -huh. Well, we should say, in fact, that uh, when Genoway started with PAMS or MAMS, that in fact this became, this was really one of the great breakthroughs that put the innate immune system on its feet. Right. Oh, and yeah. it, led to the, it led to the understanding of the interactions with, with receptors, like toll like receptors and so forth. So this has been a new day in immunology. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting, it's really remarkable how much of an impact on it microbiology has had. Oh good, yeah, absolutely. good for us. Good for our side. You bet. And, <laughs> and you almost you almost want to ask the question: Does the poor bobtail squid have compliment? <laughs> it does. Well, you would expect it because of the way these things are are remodeling themselves. Sure. And I think what I found, I always try to draw parallels in in new material that I. I read. And this was a, a new area for me. I sort of knew the story of the luminescence, but I hadn't gotten into the level of detail of how the squid actually ejects material and how this happens. And so I immediately thought back to last the last twim in which we were talking about diarrheal diseases and thinking about <laughs> E. coli in Shigella. And is diarrhea just nothing more than a different form, if you will, of mutualism, where you have E. coli that requires 100,000 microbes to cause an effect versus Shigella that only requires one. And you look at the development that's going on, albeit with um, the the E. coli-like creatures that use type 3 secretion that actually cause a morphogenic response. And in the case of Salmonella, where the Salmonella sacrifices some of the population for the good of the bulk of the population in order to generate enough tetrathionate that confers a selective advantage for Salmonella growing in the lumen. And so I think your binary system where you have Vibrio fisheri and this beautiful animal that goes through these behaviors, we can begin to assemble the binary experiments that will help 
the poor soul molecular biologists who are doing micro and these very complex systems to begin to design their experiments so they can ask and answer real questions. So I have a question about Shigella. So um, you had mentioned that Shigella, you know, the, the, min the infective dose is so low in Shigella. So you, you, take, you can take 1 to 10, you can ingest 1 to 10 Shigella, as I understand it, and you can get full-blown full sh Shigellosis. Has, have people followed whether or not they divide all the way down, or <laughs> do they go down and get to a place where they divide, or how does, how does Shigella progress? I wish Jerry Kirsch were here to answer that question. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I honestly don't know. It's one of my fascinations uh, with this whole enteric interaction because if you go back to the juvenile squid and developing these complex interactions in the crypts mm -hmm. and the whole intestine, and I think either, one, of, one of your two papers was talking about how the importance of our understanding these interactions can actually lead to a better understanding of things like inflammatory bowel disease. I oh, yeah. Th I think this is where we really need to begin to carefully and, and as elegantly as possible to dissect these interactions. And yeah. it, it's, I think that the, the tracheal cytotoxin, by taking out the cilia in the case of uh, Bordetella, the, tra the tracheal cilia, and in the case of Neisseria gonorrhea, where it takes out the cilia of the fallopian tubes, it immediately provides an understanding of how gonorrhea can cause pelvic inflammatory disease, which then leads to uh, effectively the sterilization of, of the woman because mm -hmm. she's lost the cilia that can effectively move the egg down the tube from the right. mere interaction of the Neisseria interacting and doing this biology that in another species is actually to its selective advantage. It's truly elegant. It's really fascinating, the case of Bordetella pertussis and gonorrhea that you get tracheal cytotoxin causing damage. But then in the case of maturation of the gut-associated lymphoid tissue, it's required there. Uh -huh. And it also seems to be the element shed from bacteria that sets the third wave of the mammalian sleep cycle. And so mm -hmm. it, without tracheal cytotoxin and its interaction, its normal interactions, we'd be a mess. And so <laughs> it's, it's like, Con, it, it just drives home the idea that it's context specific. Sure. All of these things, when they're presented in the wrong place at the wrong time, you, you know, you can, you can be in big trouble. Let me add my two cents here. I spent my uh, PhD thesis work at uh, Notre Dame uh, working on germ free animals. Wow. So I, I presume that I'm now called an A microbiologist, but I, I worked on ignotobiologist. <laughs> well, known life, that's true, but uh, no bacteria has that. So I was investigating a worm infection called Trichinella spiralis, mm -hmm. and I was infecting germ-free or bacteria-free animals. And they gave such an erratic response that I dropped that project and moved on to something else. But now, in retrospect, of course, I should have stayed with that because Trichinella requires a normal microbiome in order to infect mice. Mm -hmm. And when you, when, you take, when you take those mice out of the incubator and allow them to conventionalize and then infect them with Trichinella, everything is fine. Yeah. So wow. even parasites that are gut dwelling need a normal f flora <laughs> in order yeah. to complete can I, can their I lives. Can I make a general point at this point? This sure. Is very broad. Sure. Uh, I've maintained for quite a while that microbiologist is microbiology is a great example of an integrative science. Here, here. This is what we're talking about. We're talking yeah. about integrating from all aspects of biology. Sure. And microbiology just does that. Yeah. And in fact, it's very interesting that in the paper that you published in PNAS, Margaret, um, it's wonderful to read the list of addresses of your co-authors. <laughs> co oh, I know. <laughs> microbiology departments, from molecular biology, pediatrics, 
electrical oh, yeah. and computer engineering and ophthalmology <laughs> and visual sciences. What could be yep. more integrative than that? <laughs> I know, I know. Well, you know, it, in order to, it, it's been really fun for me because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, my training is in comparative animal physiology, and then I did five and a half years of postdoc in protein biochemistry biophysics. But uh, I've, of course, I'm sitting in a microbiology building, and I hang uh, out with microbiologists all yeah, the time, yeah. and, and, I, and I do microbiology with my symbiosis. So, uh, but, but when it comes to 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 getting you know really high quality reagents and things like that, you want L good LPS, you go to Mike Apicella at University <laughs> of Iowa, <laughs> you know and that yeah, sort of yeah, thing, yeah, and yeah. and he'll he'll keep you he'll keep you straight on how to use it properly and all that other. So um, I've had just wonderful wonderful collaborators, and that particular project was a really complicated one, and we wanted to find out. So there's this huge question in symbiosis. Once you get your partners, how in the world do you keep them? You know, how do we keep you all of our people You make them happy. You yeah. make them so that, happy. So that, one, they don't overgrow. Yeah. Like our microbiota doesn't overgrow us in, in something like IBD or, or thrush or some of these other bad things that can happen. So there's got to be, the other thing is that your immune system could completely eliminate them. So there's got to be an incredibly delicate balance that's created to keep us healthy. Yeah. And in the squid, this involves this really, really complex diel rhythm. And at the end of the day, what was fun for us was to see that, and, you know, it was just a testament to how biology is so siloed that we often don't talk to one another. <laughs> So the, um, mm. the people who study the gut epithelium have shown that there's a tremendous circadian rhythm on the transcriptome of the gut epithelium. And the people who study the mucosal immune system of the gut have also found that there's a profound circadian rhythm on the mucosal immune system. And of course, they didn't reference one another in their in their in their papers but um of course sitting here as microbiologists we would say well for heaven's sakes the microbes <laughs> are setting that but it to this day um we don't know that uh the micro whether or not the microbes are setting those circadian rhythms how they participate and whether or not the microbiome itself is on a circadian I wonder what Pavlov Actually, would say to that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Margaret, I, in reading your paper, which I did with the light, uh, I ran into this word, which was news to me, uh, diel, D-I-E-L, yeah. yeah. and I'm wondering, what's the deeper meaning of it, and why don't you use circadian <laughs> for, for the term? Well, what's the so, reason? Well, so the reason it's is, favorite. the word circadian to a biologist who studies circadian rhythms has a very, very specific meaning. And what a circadian rhythm is, is it is a rhythm that will become entrained by a cue and will, once entrained, can, will persist after that cue is taken away for a certain amount of time. And so, uh, so when you go, you're, we're on circadian rhythms, right? And so when you go to, you fly and you get jet lagged. You're jet lagged because you're on a circadian rhythm. <laughs> and even though your light cues and everything are different, your body is still responding to the to the rhythms of the place where you had come from because you had been entrained there. And it takes you a few days to adjust to a new circadian rhythm. Now, a diel a circadian rhythm is a subset of diel rhythms. And a diel rhythm is any kind of rhythm that's daily. Right. So in the case of the squid. It's so complex, there are elements of it being circadian. That is, in other words, the, there's some anticipation of light, the light cue, and some anticipation of the onset of darkness. But the venting behavior itself must be cued every single day uh. by the onset of dawn. And so that is not a circadian rhythm that's uh, a, it's a daily rhythm or diel rhythm you have to reset the clock every day every day well you have to you ha in order to get that particular 
right. uh, event to happen, you have to to give them a like you. Now that I know what dial is, I'm. I'd like to ask you a question about the paper. As I say, it's fascinating, but the the most puzzling thing to me was the expulsion of the Vibrio fisheri every morning at, at dawn by the host. And, uh, you know, this makes sense, I agree, but it's puzzling in terms of the uh, energetics of it. I mean, there's mm -hmm. a lot of energy wasted in doing this. And what are your thoughts about that? Why does it do it this yeah. way? Why doesn't it just retain the bugs? Well, so, so it's, a, it's a really interesting question. Because and and it's and it's a lot of controversy. Uh, you know, Rich Lensky, for instance, um, feels that it might be a way to knock the population down um, and to dissuade cheaters. Okay, cheating non the the proliferation of cheating non luminous strains. I don't understand exactly how that might work, but in could it also event, uh, yeah. in effectively facilitate the vigor of the population so that yeah. you don't effectively evolve yourself out of the light business that's it that's it and so the other the the other thing of course is the bacteria continue to grow slowly so you can either let them trickle out or you can hold them while you need them which is at night and then when you bury in the sand during the day you can vent them all out so you can grow them up while you're sleeping. What happens right? when you grow them in the total absence of light for weeks on end? So if you, this is interesting, and we've The never, squid or the bacteria? Both. No, you the have squid, to ask the question. The squid with the bacteria. What happens if you put them in a light box that has no light that gets in? Uh -huh. How long will those bacteria stay in the pits? What happens is, is for, um, they will hold it because they're not getting a light cue, so they'll hold it for a long time, several days. Several days. And this is in the juveniles that we've done this. And then, after a while, they just begin to leak. <laughs> they just start to leak. And but the they, bacteria overgrow that in the yes, meantime? Yes, they just, well, they they have two pores on the surface. And, and you know, once once the, the development has finished, the three pores on each side of the light organ of the juvenile coalesce into a single pore, and that pore stays open to the environment. And so what happens is Vibrio fisheri slowly grows. And and they they seem to be able to manage that okay for a few days. But then they just begin to leak sort of incontinent. You know, they just sort of <laughs> leak. And uh, so, yeah, that's what happens. I mean, the other, the other thing that's kind of obvious is if you, the farther you go away from adult populations of the animal the harder it is for a juvenile to be colonized in that water. In other words, so you've got the animals seem to be, the, the adult animals in their venting every day seem to be seeding the environment uh. for, the, for the, ape, the juveniles when they hatch up. Do they know how to retain an inoculum? So not to exp expel everybody, but retain a significant number just yeah, in case? They retain, yeah, they retain between 5 and 10%. And it's oh, I see. From, they regrow from the inside. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's it's like making sourdough bread. <laughs> you, it's like making sourdough bread. You there keep you the starter culture around. You feed the starter yeah. culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You make the bread. <laughs> you put the bread in the oven. It goes away by somebody eating it, and then yeah. you still have the starter culture. So what if you sterilize juveniles in a tank, and mm -hmm. there's a sand bottom, and you mm -hmm. put them on a day-night cycle, but they mm -hmm. don't have any vibrio in their pores. Will they come out of the sand at night? So they will. Uh, yeah, they will. So Even they, though they know they're they, going to get eaten. <laughs> well, so you know what? In the field, you never see an animal without symbionts. Oh, that's true. So but. yeah, and so I think some of that the behavior might be hardwired. Right. Um, they probably in the field, if they didn't have symbionts, they would probably, I mean, there's so by selection, be... the ones that didn't have it got eaten. And then the ones that yeah. were left were the ones yeah. with the bacteria, I see. Yeah. So let me summarize this for, <laughs> for anyone listening who, who has been lost. So the, in the morning, the squid shed their, most of their Vibrio. And then they, do they do that in the sand or just before they go into the sand? 
Yeah, probably a little bit of both. Okay. I, I would imagine it's animal specific. All right. Yeah. So then uh, they spend the day in the sand, and during that time, they acquire more vibrio, and then at night, they go out with a full complement and they grow. Yeah, they and grow them back them, up. So. Yeah. Now, and tell us what you were looking at in this paper. You used transcriptome analysis to look at both the squid and uh, the bacterium. Right. Yeah, so we we noticed this really amazing venting behavior on a day-night cycle. And so what we wanted to 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 find out was how the animal and the bacteria talk to one another over a day-night cycle. So what we did was we took uh we dissected the animal and took the epithelium that supports the bacteria. We separated the epithelium uh, the epithelial cells from the bacterial cells, and we isolated the RNA out of each at four different times of day, just before dawn, a few hours after dawn, in the late afternoon, and in the evening. And so at those four times of day, we got to see what the bacteria are saying in terms of their gene expression, what they're doing in terms of their gene expression, and what the animal is is doing. And so what was what was fun was at just before dawn, it looked like all of the genes that 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 support the shape of the of the the crypt cells, all those cytoskeletal genes, were turned way up, hmm. and we were just it was really amazing. It, all so forty three of the forty eight genes that we could recognize as cytoskeletal genes were turned up. So we thought, oh, there has to be something really going on with these cells. So we looked by TEM, and the tissue looks like EHEC, like it's intro, uh, you know, it looks like Shigella. It's the the um, the microvilli are effaced, and the apical surfaces of the the animal cells are blubbing into the crypt space where the bacteria are. And so there was just disruption of all the cell membranes. Well, so what well, now you know where I got my diarrhea idea. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. I mean, it, it, it's, it's really pretty remarkable. And to go yeah. back to Elio's comment of earlier, the energy budget of this, I oh, mean, I- 10% of the 14,000 host genes – were regulated at this time. 10% is a big number energetically to go through and do that transcription in the ocean where nutrients can't be all that abundant. And the differences that you were seeing is a 50-fold difference in the number of differentially regulated host genes, a 50-fold difference. That's where you don't even need a statistician to help you analyze the data such that that all those cytoskeletal genes it was such a strong signature so Mm. looking at by tem we see this disruption and then we said well what are the bacteria doing in response if you look at the time point a few hours later the bacteria turn on all the genes associated with the use of lipids the use of membranes and so the bacteria say aha look at all this (laughs) food that's coming out here right lunch and that's what they seem to grow back up on. Wow. Once the once they use all that stuff, at the same time they're using it all up, the animal cells are completely repolarizing and making new microvilli. And so at some point the bacteria, all of those lipid lipids and membranes are used up. So then the animal begins to feed them chitin. Hmm. And so the actually the membranes are used by Chitin, excuse me, anaerobic respiration, which is a pH neutral, very benign sort of thing as far as the environment is concerned. It's very pH neutral, not acidic, not basic. But then they go into chitin fermentation. And chitin fermentation drives the pH into very acidic, mm. more and more and more acidic. And so the environment becomes very acidic. And um, it's very. It, we think that it's very acidic just before the venting process. Now, I don't know if I can layer this on, but we found some some subsequent data that during the day there are two molecules that the animal puts into the crypt space, 
And one is something called alkaline phosphatase, which detoxifies the lipid A, detoxifies the endotoxin that the bacteria are making, that the symbionts are making. And the other molecule is something called the peptidoglycan recognition protein, and it breaks down the TCT that the bacteria are making (laughs) all the time. Okay? So it's detoxifying. But those two enzymes that the animal is putting into the crypt space to detoxify the bacterial, what you might call toxins, are pH sensitive. Ah. So that's right. And so <laughs> during the chitin fermentation process, those enzymes lose their ability to detoxify. And so we think our model is that, is that those toxins build up and, and perturb the animal cells, and then the animal at some point says, okay, this is ridiculous. When the light cue comes, you're gone. Wow. It's the, it's the squid's equivalent of diarrhea. That's right. That's right. And it, and it's really a very elegant and simplified model of diarrhea. And when you, when you begin to think about the molecular biology that this system has taught us, it will give the microbiome folks working in the gut where you have Salmonella, Shigella, E. coli, these very different um, commensal organisms like E. coli to the frank pathogens like Salmonella and Shigella, it will allow us the ability to begin to figure out a strategy to manage these complex diarrheal diseases. We hope so. Richard Garant, are you listening? <laughs> can, I, can I go back to a point you just made? You just said something very interesting about the alkaline phosphatase that yeah. uh, detoxifies LPS. That's news to me. Uh, Michael, do you know about detoxification of LPS? That doesn't grow on trees exactly, does it? No, I, I thought, well, I know, I know um, you know, the, the gynecoxi, you know, dump a lot of LPS in their normal life cycle, but most... And I guess if we go back and think about it, the the good anaerobic bacteria in our gut, like Bacteroides, don't have that much LPS. That's true. And and so I, I guess we we have to go back and and begin to integrate some of these things. So yeah. Mark, put on your other hat and think about meeting topics, so that we mm-hmm. can begin to to think about how how to bring speakers together that could help us begin to to think about this because I'm like Elio I didn't know that Alk Foss I I know a lot about mm-hmm. Alk Foss mm-hmm. but I didn't know that Alk Foss would go after LPS in a in a it, to to use the analogy yeah. in a real clinical way where it's actually yeah. responsible yeah. for a clinical thing where it's yeah. doing something important for the host in yeah. this particular case Here's a really interesting tidbit. So they have found um, that in the blebs of the microvilli of the gut that you have high levels of alkaline phosphatase. And Karen Gillerman at the University of Oregon showed in zebrafish that, um, that the alkaline phosphatase that's in the gut of zebrafish uh, does in fact detoxify by, you know, pulling the the two the the two phosphate groups off of either side of the LPS molecule, it um, detoxifies the LPS. Wow! So Karen wow. Gillerman, I think that was a cell host and microbe paper maybe four years ago, and so oh, it went right by me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very cool paper. Well, what about this in inflammatory bowel disease? Because this this could begin to form a hypothesis about inflammatory bowel disease if if people are not making the right amount of alkaline FOS, if humans make alkaline FOS to effectively clean us out of the bad bacteria that then will drive the immune system to cause the chronic inflammation. Mm. Um I, I got to go and read yeah. some of that that literature and ask that question. Or any of you working on inflammatory bowel disease, ask the question about what's the level of alk fos in in that patient population and whether or not the bacteria are, are going there. There's a recent paper in PNAS by Flavel, 
and uh, and uh, and Gordon uh, and Gordon, and it talks about uh, the inflammasome and the connection between the inflammasome, which is a collection of proteins involved in making cytokines involved in inflammation, etc., and the fact that in mutants. Uh, the void of some of the inflammasome, there's a special bacterium, a member of the bacteroides, Prevotella, which takes over. And I said, yeah. I wonder if there's, all this is not connected together. It very, because Prevotella is a wonderful little gram negative that, right, exactly. that is, when it gets in the wrong spot, a frank pathogen. Okay, uh, I just wanted to read a few emails before we wrap this up. Um, the first one is from Mia, who says, Hello to Vince and all you other wise humanitarian folks bringing us TWIM and TWIV. I'm a 47-year-old individual diagnosed with GAD and OCD. Germophobia used to be my most prevalent and crippling symptoms of these disorders until my doctor found the right drug combo. I began listening to TWIV to educate myself in hope of conquering my fear of germs with knowledge in case I ever develop a tolerance to the medications. I just wow. wanted all you good people to know what a service you provide to people from all perspectives. And thank you for changing my attitude toward viruses into one of deep interest and curiosity and little worry. I look forward to understand other microbes in the same positive light as I listen to and enjoy TWIM. I have one request for a topic, one microbe that nearly drove me over the edge before treatment was a long recurring bout of C. diff colitis. Oh my, it's a rough one. I read awful, scary internet websites devoted to this deadly hospital plague, but my kindly physicians asked me not to pay any attention to those sites. Why do we have such bad bugs in our gut, and how do we get them? And RE twim number two, have not fecal en enemas been used in the past to fight C. diff as well? Any info you could provide on this uh, microbe in a future twim would do a great kindness to a non-scientist like myself. Thank you so much for your huge contribution to public awareness and sanity. Well, in <laughs> fact, Mia, we had ha hoped to have um, a fellow from the University of Michigan, David Aronoff, uh, on our twim, our twim episode in uh, New Orleans, and he forgot to show up, but he promised us he would come back on, and he, he, he works on C. diff. So he can tell you all about that. I think that'll be just perfect. Uh, Lance writes, you did something similar to this in TWIM number two, but I thought this looked interesting. From yesterday's nature, enterotypes of the human gut microbiome. And talking about multidisciplinary studies, Elio, this has about 50 <laughs> authors. Looks like a paper in physics rather they than did here in is they, <laughs> they sequenced 22 European metagenomes. Wow. From Danish, French, Italian, and Spanish individuals and added a bunch of others as well and looked at the bacteria. This is actually something we could do an entire twim on. Absolutely. It's very interesting. What we have to do is read all the sequences. That's right. <laughs> we'll read the sequences. <laughs> oh. uh, this is something that tap danced around today looking at a very um, elegant system where there's only a Vibrio and a, a bobtail squid. And the unfortunately, the human microbiome is much more complex, and I think the opera is going to have many, many more players. Absolutely. Well, DNA chip technology has a nice way of looking at multiple gene expressions with mountains and valleys and peaks. So maybe you could work out some kind of a visualization technique for this too. Yeah, it's all about visualization. It is. It's it's heat maps. You you yeah. you need to yeah, no, think that's about right. ways of, exactly. of making heat maps accessible right. and and that's thinking right. about heat maps. Sure. Maybe we should employ uh, Edward Tuft to help us out here. That's right. There you go. Uh, the next one's from Adrian. Greetings, Twim hosts. I'm a huge fan of Twiv PM, and I listen to a lot of podcasts, but these always make it to the top. I was a chemistry major, but now find myself with a career in software. On the side, I brew beer. I think the beer-making process would be a great topic for a twim someday, but my question is specific. Are there known pathogens that can survive the beer-making process? If improperly stored, beer can certainly spoil, but are there any of the microbes involved dangerous to humans? Beer-making lore seems to say no, citing the theory that beer consumption started out as a means to consume safe liquids. Is this true? 
Again, I love all the shows. Keep up the stellar work. I'd like to volunteer that Born On, many of us who consume anheuser book Bush products know about the Born On date. That was developed by a microbial physiologist who happens to work for anheuser Bush, and it has to do with the skunking process associated with <laughs> beer, where beers, as they age, the end products begin to react with the materials in beer, and it skunks the beer, or it gives it its off taste. So Born On actually was... Uh, a uh, microbiologist who came up with that concept who uh, works for Anheuser-Busch. So maybe we can get a few of our friends in the microbrew industry to come in and talk to us about the wonders that are beer. As long as they bring yes. samples. Through through Skype, it's going to be <laughs> hard. We'll figure Hell out fun. how to share it through Skype. I think this would be a great topic for Twib. Sure. At Twib. I have to get my podcast straight. <laughs> All right, let's wrap it up. That's another TWIM. You can find us at iTunes, at the Zoom Marketplace, at microbeworld.org, and we also have an app so you can listen on your smartphone, your Android or iPhone. You can find that at microbeworld.org slash TWIM. Send us your questions and comments. We have a bunch lined up. Keep them coming. TWIM at TWIV.TV. I'd like to thank everyone for participating. Dixon de Pommier, thanks for joining us. My pleasure, Vince. Dixon's at verticalfarm.com. Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Vincent, and especially to uh, Margaret. This has been a fascinating twim. Here yes. I'm, I'm really honored to, be, to have uh, been able to talk about what I love Great. doing. Oh, Margaret, been, <laughs> Margaret, you must be squidding. You must be. You must be what? Squidding. Squidding. Sorry. There you go. Yeah. I know. Ooh, I know. Thank you. Thank bad, you. Bad. Bad. Margaret's at the University of Wisconsin. Yes. Yeah, thanks so much, Margaret. And that's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful work. It is. Thank you. And Elio Schechter, thank you for joining us. Oh, it's so much fun. Small things considered, you can find Elio. I am Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank ASM for their support of TWIM, Communications Director Barbara Hyde, Chris Condian, and Ray Ortega, Organizational and Technical Health. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. Okay, we made it through. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, nice. Thank you. Margaret, now, now you have to, to write up this elegant model for small things considered for Elio. <laughs> hey, absolutely. I th haven't I, Elio? I've, I've, you've covered you, it a couple of times. We did aspects of it, but I think yeah. it, need, it needs quite a bit more. Figure three from the PNAS paper may be the, the best way to do it because you can, do, you can use figure three to teach introductory, introductory microbial physiology. It was absolutely fascinating from that oh. PNAS paper. Oh, great. Thank well, you. Well, if you do that, Elio, put a link to this TWIM episode. Absolutely, you're not kidding. So, um, yeah, no, we, 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 but we certainly need you. Uh, <laughs> we had a piece on uh, playing the light organ two ways, but that's three <laughs> years ago. And, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We need, we need more from you. Uh, if you have a student or a postdoc who likes to write, by all means, yep. we encourage that. Out, outstanding. Okay, that sounds fun. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Have a great Thanks, weekend. Thanks, Vincent. Bye bye.